Welcome Grade 11 learners to another installment of Life Sciences. It's Term 3, you guys are in the, in the mix, in the thick of things. Let's get straight into Term 3 and let's prepare for those exams at the end of this term. We start off with a topic which is called gases exchange and we're looking at gases exchange today in different organisms. And just from a continuity perspective, if you recollect from last term, we looked at <coughs> gases, uh, we looked at respiration, we looked at how the process of respiration occurs, we discussed anaerobic and aerobic respiration. And I, and I think it's important for you to be able to uh, put that into context of now we're looking at the next process. So yes, respiration requires oxygen to take place. How does that oxygen get into the cells? So we, what we need is we need to look at the gaseous exchange system or the mechanism that allows air to enter the organism to reach the cells. So what we're looking at today is we're looking at some of the different organisms and how gaseous exchange occurs in them. And then we're going to try and focus on some questions and try and relate the content to those questions. So let's get straight into it, this, guys. So the overall is gaseous exchange. And as I said, we're looking at gaseous exchange in different organisms. We're going to spend some time over the next few weeks looking at gaseous exchange in humans specifically. But I think what is important to do is let's look at some of the key concepts or terminology that we need to understand and differentiate between. We often come across the term breathing. And this is easily sometimes um, confused with the term respiration or the term gases exchange. So what does breathing refer to? Breathing refers to the mechanical process whereby air moves into and out of the lungs. And that basically involves both inhalation and exhalation. So often we refer to the process of bringing in air and removing air rich in carbon dioxide as breathing. And that comprises of inhalation and exhalation. The next concept is gases exchange. What does gases exchange mean? When we look at the word exchange, it refers to the process of change of types of gases in terms of the concentration. And here we're looking at gases changing concentration. So gases exchange is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide across a gaseous exchange surface. So essentially what this refers to is the process where the oxygen from it could be the tubes, the trachea, the bronchi, or from the outside travels through a membrane or through a gaseous exchange surface and enters the cell where it is actually used for the process of respiration, cellular respiration that is. Okay, and that brings us to the last concept which we need to understand and differentiate from the others is cellular respiration. And if you recollect from the last couple episodes that we've had in the previous term, respiration refers to the release of energy from glucose in the presence of oxygen. And this occurs at a cellular level in the mitochondria. So here we're going in from breathing, which is at an organ level, which is assisted by the lungs. Then we get to gaseous exchange, which is further occurring at the alveoli or at a, at a, at a macroscopic level. And then we get into cellular respiration, which occurs at an organelle level inside the cell, which we refer to as the mitochondria. So we, we've got to understand the concept of where and how respiration occurs, gases exchange, and obviously the process of breathing that occurs. So what are the key concepts? It's very important for us to understand that in order for gases exchange to occur, there needs to be a respiratory surface, a surface through which gases can travel through or be exchanged. So we refer to that surface as the respiratory surface. Now, in order for that respiratory surface to be effective or for respiration or breathing to be effective, we need the gases exchange surface to be efficient in that process. So what is it that allows the gases exchange system to be effective? We need to look at the effectiveness of this gas exchange membrane now. So to enable oxygen and carbon dioxide to diffuse through it, it must be one of the following. One is that it needs to be having a large surface area. And this, the simple reason for this is this will ensure that the maximum exchange of gases takes place. And guys, if you think of the process of respiration, respiration is the active process of breathing in oxygen and take exhaling carbon dioxide. And why is that needed? That is needed for cellular respiration. If we look at organisms and as they become more advanced and more evolved and more adapted or more active, then the requirements of the need for oxygenated blood is, is essential. And that can determine the survival of those organisms. And hence, in order for 
the exchange of gases to be efficient, you need to have a maximum surface area so that that process of gases exchange can be enhanced and be maximized. So it needs to have a large surface area. The second requirement is that the membrane needs to be thin and permeable. And if you think about thin and permeable, thin refers to the thickness of the membrane that's, that lines the cells or the area where the exchange of gases occurs. So that surface needs to be thin. It also needs to be permeable. And permeable in that it allows gases to freely pass through with little or no e energy required. And we refer to that as being permeable. If you put this into context of the cellular membrane, remember the cell membrane is selectively permeable. And that allows certain substances to enter, enter that. And that's through osmosis. Here we're looking at diffusion, which is a concept based on the movement of molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration. And for that, it is, the process is, is, is increased, is, is made more efficient by the membrane being thin as well as being permeable. And this allows easy and rapid diffusion of those gases. Another requirement for it is that it should be moist. And the reason that it needs to be moist is that gases will dissolve in a liquid medium and then diffuse through in, in a solution form. And having a moist surface membrane allows for the efficient exchange of gases across that membrane. And hence you'll find that the membrane is often kept moist. And we're going to look at how that is maintained moist in different organisms. It needs, it needs to be well ventilated. And what does that mean? There needs to be a good oxygen supply and a good mechanism of removing carbon dioxide. And we refer to that process as inhalation and exhalation or the mechanism that can maintain the diffusion gradient between the air that is taken in, which is rich in oxygen, and the air that is exhaled, which is rich in carbon dioxide. Something that increases the efficiency of the gases exchange system is an efficient transport system. And for this, you need to have your respiratory surface in close contact with, with either the blood system or a system of capillaries that can absorb and quickly carry away the oxygen, oxygenated blood and then transfer the deoxygenated blood uh, gases from the deoxygenated blood back into the alveoli in the case of humans. So you need to have an efficient transport system. And that could be made up of blood capillaries or vessels that allow the gases to be brought or taken away effectively. And very importantly is that the system needs to be well protected. And in order for that to be protected, you need to have either an external covering or you need to have some kind of secretion that prevents it from dehydrating or desiccation. So you'll find that it's important that the system is protected both from mechanical injury and from desiccation, which is essentially drying out. And that is why you often find the membrane protected either in humans, we look at the rib cage, in other organisms like the earthworm, you'll find that there's a, there's a secretion of a mucus layer that keeps them moist and prevents them from dehydrating. And that is an, a mechanism that allows the efficiency of the system to function optimally. Cool. So we're going to have a very quick overview of what I've just said. And I'm just going to go through some illustrations just to show you how the large surface area is an efficient adaptation for this process. So if we look at this image, it's basically an image of the alveoli. And we're going to discuss the structure of the alveoli. But these are air sort of pockets at the base of, at, in the lungs, which basically are increasing the surface area for the exchange of gases. And around them, you'll see a rich supply of blood vessels. So this infundibulum, which is collectively referring to all of these, is made up of several air-like pockets, sacs, called alveoli. And these alveoli are increasing the surface area so that there's a maximum exchange of gases occurring. So this is increased. If we look at the gills of fish, you'll find that these have gill rakers. Sort of, if it looks like, if you look at a rake, it's got these sort of lines running across. And this essentially increases the surface area for the exchange of gases. So what happens, water constantly moves over these. And as they move over this, the oxygen diffuses in and the carbon dioxide diffuses out into the water. So this is increased by the numerous folds, or we refer to them as gill rakers that we see in the alveo in the gill slits of fish or aquatic organisms. Um, Let's look at the respiratory surfaces of some of the aquatic or terrestrial or organisms that are amphibious. Now you'll find that the respiratory surface of the body are in contact with the external environment. 
and hence they need to be specialized. And for that you'll find that in the case of certain aquatic like aquatic or terrestrial or amphibious organisms like the salamander, you'll find they have external gills. And these gills allow them to exchange gases from the atmosphere and allow them to release CO2 back into them. So these gills or gills, external gills allows for the act the exchange of atmospheric oxygen when they're on land. We've seen the typical we, uh, lungs of humans. You find that most animals being active have lungs and these lungs are well protected. And this is a system that allows the efficient exchange of gases to support the active lifestyle of the organisms. Okay. We also discussed that it needs to be moist and thin and here we can see that a section of a capillary being very close to a blood cell and here you see a thin membrane that's a, that is present between the blood cells and the alveoli. So this is the alveoli that we're looking at in here. So I'm going to just sort of highlight this area here. That's the alveoli and here we're finding the blood capillaries that carry the oxygen and there's a thin surface area here between this that allows for the rapid exchange of gases between the oxygen in going from the alveoli into the red blood cells and the carbon dioxide from the red blood cells back into the alveoli. So again, a very efficient mechanism to ensure a rapid exchange of gases. The third requirement was near to the axis of an efficient transport system and we said that the gases need to be carried away and for that you saw that around the alveoli there was an extensive covering of capillaries that allow for that ex exchange of gases. Okay, so let's look at, and that's exactly what I was showing you here, you can see that the alveoli on the external surface have blood capillaries and these allow for the exchange of gases efficiently, okay, between the air in the environment, which is coming through there, and the air which is surrounded in the capillaries on the external surface. So when we look at the capillaries here, they're very closely lining the alveoli. And there's the rapid exchange created by the diffusion gradient between the blood in the capillaries, where you've got red blood cells, and the air in the alveolar, which is rich in oxygen. So we see this mechanism being maintained by the, ox by the difference in the concentration of gases between the two areas. Okay, so let's look at the respiratory system in fish. And again, this lesson is about comparing... Um, the respiratory surfaces and systems in different organisms. We know that fish are aquatic organisms and they live in an environment that is saturated with air or has oxygen in the water. So the fish rely on structures called gills to exchange gases. And if we look at the gills of fish, you'll find that they are adapted. They're slightly below um, an exter external covering called the operculum. When you look at the gill slits, you'll find that they are present under an external flap called the operculum and that is the opercular chamber. Underneath that you'll find that there are gill arches and these gill arches contain gill rakers and these gill rakers basically are going to sort of receive the oxygen from the water and that's going to diffuse through. So the respiratory surfaces of fish are an internal gills and these are adapted to use dissolved oxygen in the water Water has a much lower oxygen content than air. It's between 4 to 6 percent as compared to uh, when you're on land, or aquatic or atmospheric air, which is about 17 to 20 percent. So it means that there needs to be a, a very efficient and well-developed system to allow for the maximum absorption of air from, very, from oxygen from, from water, which is not much saturated in oxygen. Okay, so we said that water moves through the respiratory surfaces in only one direction. As the fish swims, it opens its mouth so that water enters and flows over the gills. And then it lifts its opercular gills covering to let the water out. And if you've seen fishes in a tank, you'll notice that they have outer coverings just below the, the eyes at the back. You'll find that you've got these slits and that's the opercular covering. So water constantly flows over these gill slits, allowing the air to enter. And there's an exchange of gases between the water and the blood capillaries in the gills and that it allows for the exchange of gases and this is generally a one directional movement in that the fish moves in one direction the water moves in the opposite direction creating a diffusion gradient for increasing the effectiveness or efficiency at which 
gases exchange can occur. The guilds also have typical features of an efficient gases exchange system. So the guilds have an increased surface area. Each guild has two rows of very delicate, delicate gill filaments, and these are subdivided to increase the surface area. As water flows over the gills, gases exchange takes place. So they sort of, sort of sweep through and they filter the water, and through that exchange of gases occurs. The gills are also well supplied with blood, and you'll find that the gill filaments appear pink or red in color due to the presence of rich supply of blood capillaries. And often when you, if you do go to a fish market and you want to see um, how fresh a fish is, you often lift the operculum and the dark red color will indicate the freshness of that fish. And hence, it is a rich supply of blood just below the operculum that allows for the efficient exchange and transportation of the, that oxygen. It's also a very thin surface. Each filament is covered by an external thin layer of cells so that the gases can enter and leave rapidly and easily. We also need to look at frogs. And frogs are partly aquatic or partially aquatic. So they spend their tadpole stages in water and then they become terrestrial for most of their lives. And these adults live on land and they become air breathing. So here you find the transition from living in an aquatic environment to living in a terrestrial environment. So this needs, there needs to be a system that allows for this adaptation from a change in habitat so that the system can be efficient. So when we look at gills, when we look at tadpoles, they use their skin and they have a moist skin and gills for respiration. The surface area to volume ratio of tadpoles is large so they can rely on diffusion to adequately meet the oxygen needs. So it's through their skin and through the gills that gas exchange occurs. And remember that being in water, they are constantly surrounded with this aquatic medium where oxygen is present in the water. However, as they move onto land and they undergo metamorphosis, they develop the ability to be able to respire through either their lungs, through their skin, and even through their, um, through their gills. Okay, so an adult frog uses three surfaces for gas exchange. One is the skin, which is the main site for respiration. It is very well supplied with blood vessels. Second is the floor of the mouth, which is large and well supplied with blood capillaries. And the third is the lungs. So it can also respire through the mouth, the lungs, and the skin. And where the lungs are physically able to carry out the process of inhalation and exhalation. So here we're looking at an organism that has three different mechanisms of being able to respire or bringing oxygen in into the body. Guys, we're going to look at the insects and then we're going to go into a short break and when we get back, we're going to look at some of the more complex systems. When we look at insects, guys, you've got to remember that insects have an internal respiratory surface. They take in and expel air through breathing pores called spiracles. So when you look at, when you look at an organism like the locust, you'll find that on the lower parts of the abdomen, the back parts, you'll find tiny or small openings and these openings basically are called spiracles through which gases enter and leave. So these are called spiracles and this is the openings through which gases exchange occurs. Insects are very active and may require large quantities of energy and oxygen so that they need to have an efficient respiratory system. If you think of insects, they actively fly and hence to be able to sustain that active um, uh, mechanism they need to have an efficient transport system for gases and then if you look at the process of uh, respiration or breathing in insects you'll find that it's quite complex but essentially it works through thoracic spiracles and you've got abdominal air sacs which allow air to enter and then travel through via uh, tracheoles into the cells and to the blood system where it is needed. Insects differ from terrestrial vertebrates in that they do not have lungs or blood capillaries. Instead, they have a system of branching air tubes called tracheal tubes, which is different from what we've seen in, in frogs. And these can directly carry the air to the cells of the body. So here we find a system of tracheal tubes that takes air directly to the cells where they need it. And hence, they lack a system of lungs and blood capillaries. Okay, so that's another diagram on showing you the air spaces which get filled up with air and that air is then transported via the trachea or tracheal tubes to the cells which are need, then going to use it. So guys, we've had a long extended session 
I'll give you guys a short break. When we get back, we're going to look at some more complex systems, and then we're going to tackle some questions. So let's have a stretch break, get some water, and I'll see you guys at the back of the break. Welcome back, guys. So we've spent some time looking at how gases exchange or the exchange of gases occurs in some of your aquatic organisms. We looked at frogs, we looked at insects. What about plants? Yes, plants do need oxygen. Yes, they do need oxygen for respiration. Absolutely correct. So as much as plants need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, plants also require oxygen for respiration. So plants have a mechanism of bringing in air rich in oxygen, which is used by the cells for cellular respiration, in addition to carbon dioxide, which is used for, for the process of photosynthesis. So let's look at gases exchange in a dicotyledonous plant. And here we're looking at a photomicrograph of what we know today is, and I'm sure you guys have seen images of these before. These are the stomatal apparatus. I'm going to try and change my color so that I can highlight that for you. Here you're seeing a pore on the surface of the epithelial layer. And these allow for the exchange of gases into the leaf and out of the leaf. So here we're looking at the stomata, the stomatal apparatus, which is basically a mechanism that allows for the exchange of gases in the leaf of plants. Okay, so gases exchange occurs mainly in leaves, which are thin, flat, and have a waxy cuticle on the epidermis to reduce water loss, but this interferes with gases exchange, and hence the leaves have specialized pores called stomata. And these are generally on the ventral surface or the surface below the leaf. So you, it's not on the dorsal surface because the dorsal surface has a waxy cuticle and that is there to prevent the excessive loss of water during transpiration. So each stoma, which is a singular for stomata, has a guard cell that can control the opening and closing of the pores. So if we look at this image here, we'll find that on the stoma, which is the opening, is enclosed by what we call guard cells on either end. And these guard cells can control the um, stoma in terms of the opening and the closing, and that will be based on a potassium concentration difference and as a result of photosynthesis. But we're going to get to a question that deals with that in a little while. So what happens here is that gases diffuse directly from the atmosphere into the cells inside the pore and vice versa. So here you're going to get oxygen coming in, carbon dioxide going out, and often it's more for the carbon dioxide to come in for respiration, for photosynthesis. Once inside, the gases diffuse across the membrane of the moist cells. The internal surface of the cells are increased by spongy mesophyll cells bordering the air spaces. So I've got a cross section of the plant here, of the leaf, showing you the diffusion of gases through the stoma, which is the opening here. So through the opening, gases diffuse through, and they get into this stomatal chamber here, which creates a sort of a microclimate for the exchange of gases in there. So you've got oxygen going in and you've got carbon dioxide leaving. The oxygen then diffuses into the inter intracellular spaces and then gets into the palisade mesophyll cells where the oxygen is either used for respiration or the carbon dioxide used for, gas, for photosynthesis. So these intercellular spaces create a diffusion gradient between the air outside the, in the external atmosphere and the air inside. And that is how that diffusion gradient allows for gases to enter from the external surface into the cells that are needed, that will require these the gases for either respiration or photosynthesis. So cool. So what I want to do guys, we, we need to, let's see how much of what I've done you guys understand and put that into practice. So I've got some questions for you guys. We're going to go through these questions. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to work through them and while you're working through them I'm going to flip back and forth so that you can have access to these questions and the answers. So multiple choice, we're going to read through these, I'm going to give you some time to work through them and then we'll get back to looking at these solutions in the end of two minutes. So let me read through the multiple choice questions for you. Question one, the diagram shows a cross section of a leaf, here we're looking at a leaf and it's got labels one which points to the upper epidermis you've got label four which points to the intercellular air spaces here you've got the vascular bundle number two and number three shows you the stomatal the stoma which is the opening of the stomata so let's see what questions are based on this diagram so question one where in the leaf 
does gaseous exchange occur? So we need to determine where does gaseous exchange occur in the leaf, either at 1 and 2, B, 1 and 3, C, 2 and 3, D, 3 and 4. So I'm going to very quickly go back to that. So you've got to determine where does gaseous exchange occur. It's 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 3 and 4, or 2 and 3. But I'll get back to those options once we've done the rest. Question 2. Where and how does gases exchange, yeah, carbon dioxide enter a plant, sorry. How does it enter and where does it enter? A. Does it enter to the root hair cells and how active uptake? B. Root hair cells by diffusion. C. Through the stomata and by active uptake. Or D. Via the stomata and through diffusion. Let's look at question 3. In grasshopper, gases exchange takes place through A. Gills, B. Spiracles, C. Trachea, or D. Lungs. Question 4. The source of oxygen for aquatic plants is A. The atmosphere, B. Soil, C. Water, and D. None of the above. Question 5. The surface area of the gills are increased due to the presence of A. Lamellae, alveoli, arches, or slits. So guys, five questions. I'll give you guys two minutes to work through these, and then I'll see you guys at the end of two minutes with the answers. So you guys worked through these, there were some difficult options there, but I think they're quite accessible. If you recollect what we've done in the first half of the segment, you would have been able to work out most of these. So let's go through these questions and let's see what have you come up with. So where in the leaf does gases exchange occur? So this refers to that diagram. So gases exchange in the leaf, if we go back to this leaf, where does it occur? It's going to occur through this and through those spaces here. Okay, so it's, remember that the cuticle does not allow for the exchange of gases and here you referring to the vascular bundles and that's for the transportation of oxygen so it's going to be between three and four let's see if we got an option for between three and four yes and for those of you that got that well done so it occurs between the stomata and the intracellular air spaces and that if we go back to this diagram guys just to touch just to reflect on this diagram that we looked at so it's between these intercellular air spaces which we've labeled there and through the stomata that gases exchange occurs. So well done if you did get that. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. So where and how does carbon dioxide enter a plant? 
Now remember that carbon dioxide is required for photosynthesis. Where does that enter? So does it enter through the root hairs? No, definitely not, because root hairs are areas which absorb water, and that's for the process of photosynthesis, but that's not where it occurs. It definitely occurs through the stomata, so we know that. But let's see how does it occur. So does carbon dioxide occur through active uptake or diffusion? And it is a passive process, and hence it's going to be through diffusion and not an active process. And hence D would be the correct option there. If we go on to the next question. In grasshopper, gaseous exchange takes place through, and as I said, those openings on the abdomen of a grasshopper, those openings are called spiracles. So we see these spiracles, which are tiny openings. They're not microscopic. You actually can see them. And it's through these openings that gases exchange occurs, and we refer to those as the spiracles. Question four. The source of oxygen for aquatic animals is, so plants or organisms that live in water, where do they get the oxygen from? Does it come from the atmosphere? No. Aquatic means living in water. Does it come from the soil? Definitely not. They live in water and hence it comes from water. And remember that the water is significant, has a significantly lower percentage of oxygen than atmosphere. And hence the concentration of oxygen in the water is significantly lower and hence they need to have an efficient system to be able to absorb the oxygen from water that is poorly saturated with oxygen. So the answer there was C. Let's look at the fifth one. The surface area of gills are increased due to the presence of... Guys, if we go back to the diagram, it's due to the presence of... Uh, sorry, it's not slits, it's due to the presence of gill arches. I'm going to go back to the diagram of um, the fish so that you can have a very closer look at how that system becomes more increased. So the gills have tiny features, okay, increased surface area, each has gill filaments, and these are filaments over the take plate. Okay, so let me just go back again. Each gill has two rows of very delicate gill filaments subdivided to increase the surface area. As water flows over the gills, gas exchange takes place. If we go back to this image here, guys, and here you're seeing the gill arches, and the gill filaments. So these filaments increase the surface area. So let's get back to our questions to see if we're on point with that. Okay, get a feeling I gave you. So we said, is it the lamellae, the gill slits, the gill arches, the alveoli, or the, the um, lamellae? The answer here is the gill arches. And we said that the gill arches are those structures there that give rise to the gill filaments. And through that, you'll find that the surface area is increased. So guys, well done if you got those. I have a few more to work through, but I'm going to work through these with you as we go through the next session. Okay, so question six. The direction of flow of water is, <coughs> excuse me, dash, that of the flow of blood in the capillaries in the gills. So is in the same direction, is in the opposite direction, not connected to none of the above. So when we look at gills, and as I said early on, the water in the gill flows in the opposite direction to the blood in the gills. And that is to allow for an efficient diffusion gradient to exist between the blood and the water, and hence the exchange of gases becoming efficient. So that is in the opposite direction. Question 7. The maximum, maximum carbon dioxide concentration will be in... So when we talk of carbon dioxide concentration, we'll find that the carbon dioxide concentration increases when air is exhaled. So it will be higher in expired air because you know that from the cells that have undergone respiration, carbon dioxide is produced and that expired air would have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide. Inspired air would have a high concentration of oxygen. So when you inspire or inhale, that air has more oxygen than the air that is exhaled. Okay, so we've got that as the air that is exhaled or expired. Question two. So give one similarity between the way in which oxygen from the atmosphere reaches a muscle in an insect and the way it reaches a mesophyll cell in a leaf. Question 2.2. Give one difference in the way in which carbon dioxide is removed from a muscle in an insect and the way in which it is removed from a muscle in a fish. So guys, I'm going to leave you with these two questions to to sort of think over. We're going to go into a short break and when we get back we're going to tackle the answers to these questions. So 
read through these questions very quickly, sort of recollect what we've done already, and when we get back after the break, we're going to look at some of the answers to these. So a quick break, and then we're back. Welcome back, guys. So let's look at those solutions. Question 2 read, give one similarity between the way in which oxygen from the atmosphere reaches a muscle in an insect and the way it reaches a mesophyll cell in a leaf. So here we're comparing an insect breathing mechanism to a leaf. And let's see. So they're quite different, but they're also quite similar in that the gases will diffuse directly from... So I'm going to go back to my pen. So the gases diffuse directly from the atmosphere into the cells inside the pore in stomata of leaves and into the spiracles of the insect and vice versa. So it's through diffusion that they travel directly and in the leaf it travels through the stomata whereas in an insect it will travel through via the spiracles which is the openings that we've discussed. So here we see the similarity in which they travel but they are traveling through pores and through a system of tubes that carry them to the cells that require them. Question 2. Give one difference in the way in which carbon dioxide is removed from a muscle in an insect and the way in which it is removed from a muscle in a fish. So here we're comparing the insect to a fish and how that carbon dioxide is removed. So insects have a branching of air tubes called tracheal tubes and these tubes carry air directly to the cells of the body and diffuse out. When we look at fish, you'll find that fish have uh, blood capillaries that carry the oxygen directly to the muscles and through the muscles, through the blood system, the gases diffuse into the muscles. Whereas when we looked at insects, they have tubes called tracheal tubes and the tubes carry the blood directly to the cells and hence there is an absence of a capillary network or blood transportation system in insects. Cool. Let's look at the next question. We're still busy with question two. Fish have gills from which blood rich in carbon dioxide diffuses from capillaries in gills to the water passing over the gills via osmosis. The diagram shows the way in which water flows over the gills of a fish. So here we're looking at an illustration that shows water flow. The buccal cavity refers to the mouth and if you notice fish constantly open their mouth and that's to allow water to enter through. So we refer to that as the buccal cavity and through that water enters the mouth. So you find water constantly entering the mouth and here you've got the opercular opening so on the side of the fish you've got the covering called the operculum and through the operculum you've got the gills which, we, which we've illustrated here. So you've got the opercular cavity under which you've got your gills. And these gills constantly receive the water that travels over them and then it's released. So here you're finding the exchange of gases between the air in the water that comes over the gills and then the exchange of gases between the blood in the gills and the water that is passing over the gills. So in that mechanism we're removing the carbon dioxide. The graph below shows the changes in pressure in the buccal cavity in the, and in the opercular cavity during a ventilation cycle. So the ventilation cycle refers to the cycle of events that occurs when water enters the buccal cavity and passes over the operculum for gases exchange to occur. This graph shows you the pressure. It shows you pressure 0 and pressure 100 and then a negative 100. It shows you two illustrations. One, the pressure in the buccal cavity and the second graph, which is a continuous line, shows you the pressure in the opercular cavity. Let's look at, and this time cycle is between 0 0.1 to 0 0.6 seconds. So use the graph to explain the relationship between the buccal cavity, pressure in the buccal cavity and pressure in the opercular cavity. So what is important is that you've got to use the graph to explain this relationship. So when you look at the graph you can see that what is the relationship between the pressure increasing there and here. So you'll find that as the pressure in the buccal cavity increases, the pressure in the opercular cavity also increases. So it's quite a simple response that you need to write. So the pressure in the buccal cavity is higher I'm going to get back to this. 
is higher than the pressure in the opercular cavity. That we can see. When we look at the graph, you can clearly see that here you've got a significantly higher pressure in the buccal cavity as compared to in the opercular cavity. However, we need to discuss the relationship. When the pressure in the buccal cavity increases, the pressure in the opercular cavity increases because as, as I said, the water needs to enter the mouth and when it enters the mouth, the fish closes the mouth and then that pressure increases and pushes the water over the gills in the opercular cavity. And that is hence, that is the reason why the pressure in the opercular cavity increases and thus there is a lag and you find that lag is after a little while when the pressure increases in the opercular cavity. Okay, let's look at the next question based on the same graph. For most of this ventilation cycle, water will be flowing in one direction over the gills. Explain the evidence from the graph that supports this. So when we look at the graph, you'll find that the direction of water flow is in one direction. What evidence is there on the graph that supports this explanation? So let's look at the reason for this. So when we look at the pressure in the buccal cavity is high for most of the cycle. If you look at the pressure between 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 seconds, it's high. So between this area here, the pressure in the buccal cavity is high. However, it rapidly decreases for a short period between 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 seconds. So if you look at this period here, there's a rapid decrease in the pressure. And that is predominantly due to a change in the direction of flow of blood. 2.5. Explain how fish increase pressure in the buccal cavity. If you look at this, it's quite simple. You'll find that it swims with its mouth opened, and when it does this, it allows for air, it allows for water to enter. This allows continuous flow of water through the mouth and then over the gills. And as it closes the mouth, it builds up pressure, and that pressure creates a diffusion gradient between the air. In the, in the mouth and the air and the water in the opercular cavity. And this diffusion gradient allows for the ex effective exchange of gases between the mouth and between the gills, the blood in the mouth and the blood in the gills over the operculum. An interesting question three. So we're going to work through this and hope we can cover most of this question in this last few minutes. The drawing shows a 24 hour cycle of the opening and closing of the stomata from the same plant. Here we've got an illustration that shows you a clock and this clock starts at 12 wherever it starts but you can see that it goes through here's 6 a.m. stomata opened, 9 a.m. opens more at 12 it's slightly closed it opens further again at 13, 1500 hours and then at 1600 hours it's it's little it's almost maximum open and then it begins to close and then as you get to 3 a.m. in the morning the stomatal pore between 12 and 3 a.m. is completely shut. So this shows you a 24-hour cycle of the opening and the closing of the stomata of a of, in a plant. Let's look at 3.1. Explain how this opening and closing of the stomata is an advantage is advantageous to the plant. So how is this important that the stomata can open and close and why is this important to the plant? And guys remember that the stomata basically controls the amount of gases entering and leaving the plant and hence it's linked to photosynthesis, it's linked to respiration. Why is this important that the plant can control the opening and closing of the stomata to make it efficient? When we look at the solution for this, it's a two mark but I've tried to explain this a bit more elaborately. The stomata is an apparatus through which the plant loses water during transpiration. And that's very important. The plant also loses water through the stomata. It also allows gases to enter the leaf for photosynthesis and respiration. So it serves a dual purpose for the exchange of gases as well as it allows for the loss of water. During the day, the rate of photosynthesis is high and thus respiration is high. The stomata pore is the widest, is open the widest then. And if you look at this, during the day, the rate of photosynthesis is the highest. And during that period, there is maximum exchange of gases and hence you see that the rate of photosynthesis is high, the rate of respiration is high and hence the stomata is significantly uh, well opened. However, what happens at night? At night, 
the rate of photosynthesis is lowest because we know that during the light independent phase the light the rate of photosynthesis decrease and hence the plant uses less oxygen and the rate of respiration significantly decreases this means that gases exchange decreases and thus the stomatal pore closes if we go to the guard cells these guard cells that surround the stomata basically open up and become more turgid due to the presence of potassium ions which are produced during the process of photosynthesis and that increases the concentration in there that allows the cells to become more turgid increasing the stomatal chamber uh, to, uh, increasing the stomatal pore and hence the stomata increase however at night when photosynthesis stops the glucose present in the stomatal pore diffuses out into the guard cells decreasing the concentration of ions in there causing them to become flaccid and hence closing the stomatal pore so that's due to the presence of glucose and the absence of glucose along with potassium ions okay so here's an extension to that question the diagram shows the potassium ion concentrations in the cells around and open and around an open and closed stomata in homelinia the concentrations are in arbitrary units and nothing that's anything that's specific so these are units that are randomly put in there but in proportion to what these cells are so here you've got guard cells which are these cells that are on the external surface of the opening of the stomata so these are the guard cells you've got your subsidiary cells which are epidermal cells surrounding the guard cells and you've got on either ends of the guard cells you've got your terminal cells and these cells have been uh, given a concentration of potassium ions as an indication of the concentration of the ions in them here we have an open guard cell and here we have an open stomata and here we have a closed stomata and what we notice is that there's a significant difference between the potassium ion concentrations in both these cells so let's look at the first question explain how the movement of potassium ions accounts for the opening of the stomata when we look at the open stomata here you've got a high concentration of potassium ions when we look at the closed stomata here you've got a low concentration of potassium ions so there is a link between the concentration of these ions and the opening and closing of the stomata so i'm going to rapidly get through the solution so that i leave you with the answer to this okay so the, pot the potassium ion concentration in the guard cells increases as the potassium ions move from the subsidiary cells into the guard cells the potassium ion concentration also increases in the terminal cells and thus it causes the con the stomata to open so guys in this segment we've looked at the breathing or the, the gas exchange systems we've looked at different organisms and we looked at how they are structurally adapted what is important for you to understand is be able to compare them and look at how each organism has a, a well-adapted mechanism for gases exchange. Take care, work smart, see you next week.